Thank you to the Wolfboro Lions Club for underwriting nutritional wisdom. The Wolfboro Lions Club is committed to helping the community with health concerns such as diabetes prevention and preservation of sight and hearing. The Wolfboro Lions Club meets on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month in the 1812 room at the Wolfboro Inn. Members of the community are encouraged to attend meetings or visit the website e-clubhouse.org slash sites slash Wolfboro for more information. This is Patty Walker, registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator, and your host of Nutritional Wisdom. Today will be the eighth in a series of diabetes classes. My goal, as always, is to provide you with the necessary information you need to manage your diabetes from the comfort of your home. In my previous episodes, I've had the privilege of having individuals from the community join me. Today, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, I'll be doing the class alone, taping from my home. Today's topic is diabetes medications. Let me first start off by saying that not all persons with type two diabetes will need to take diabetes medications. Lifestyle behaviors such as diet, activity, proper sleep, and stress management have a strong impact on your blood sugar control. Not only is it possible to maintain good blood sugar control without diabetes medications, it's also possible to reduce or perhaps eliminate medications with improvements in your lifestyle choice. So I wanna give you hope in that regard. So there are over nine categories of diabetes medications and over 40 different types of medications to help improve blood sugar control. Some of them are oral, some injectable, and there's even an inhaled insulin for select individuals. Today, I will go through the different classes of medication, explain what they do, as well as tell you the benefits and the side effects. If you were a client coming to me in my office, I would be doing this because I'm not sure that all persons who are prescribed medications have the opportunity to understand what the medication does and that there could be side effects, but also what the benefits are. And that way you get to weigh the benefits and the risks and make a personal choice as to, is this a medication you wanna be on? Is it a medication you wanna be on for the rest of your life? Or would you like to do lifestyle choices to perhaps eliminate or um, stop the use of medications? So I wanna give you the power back. So we'll start with the oral medications. All right. When determining what type of medication is best, your PCP may use an algorithm like this on the screen. I'm sure the algorithm is, is a little blurred and small print there, so I'll give, you, I'll give you the synopsis of it. The summary is, if you're a person with type 2 diabetes, you will most likely be prescribed metformin as your first diabetes medication. If your A1C is above 9%, then it's not unusual for your PCP to prescribe two different oral diabetes medications, metformin being one of them. And if your A1C is above 10%, then again, you may be a candidate to start off on insulin a shot once a day plus metformin. And the reason for that is that your blood sugars are so high, it's a, it's a situation called glucose toxicity. And in order to overcome that, insulin is the best option. It doesn't mean you'll be on insulin the rest of your life. Again, depends on um, your lifestyle choices that you make going forward um, and your body's ability to produce insulin. I mean, if you've been undiagnosed with diabetes for many, many years, you may not have the proper amount of insulin production, so you might have to stay on the insulin. So each case is individual. The other thing I wanna say is good practice is to have your blood sugar control evaluated every three months. So if your A1C is above seven, I really do recommend you have your A1C taken every three months, have a follow-up visit with your PCP, and really evaluate what, um, what your options are and where your blood sugar target range is. Um, most people, target range is between six and a half and eight. And it does depend on your age, your health and living circumstances. So that's an individual number that you and your diabetes care team help set up. And 
you know, we, we go from there, but realize that it's not good, good protocol to keep your A1C at eight and nine and 10% for months on end, because that's where you run, run the risk of long-term complications. All right, so let's start with the diabetes oral medications, and we're gonna start with metformin. On this slide, you're going to see the various names, metformin, glucophage. You'll also see that there is an extended release, which means it lasts for 12 hours, and there's a liquid form if you have difficulty um, swallowing tablets. So there's a lot of varieties. So what exactly is metformin? Well, it's in the category called biguanides. I really hate this nomenclature, but it's what it is. Um, these medications have been the preferred first class of diabetes medications since the late 1990s. And the reason for that is what they do. Um, if you look, they, they decrease glucose release from your liver. We had talked in previous episodes that our livers store a substance called glycogen, which is really easily converted to glucose. And in type two diabetes, your liver actually does contribute to your, to your glucose production. So it, it, it's one of the best oral medications that tells it not to. Um, and another couple things it does is it decreases your intestinal absorption of glucose and improves insulin sensitivity. So all three are really, really good uh, benefits. It's inexpensive. Uh, to my knowledge, it's still $4 a month or $10 for a three-month supply at most pharmacies. You have no risk for hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugars with this medication doesn't cause weight gain. Some of the others we're gonna go over do, so that's a good thing. And it can lower your A1C by one to 2%. That's an impressive number. I also wanna say that good diet and activity can also lower your A1C by one to 2%. So that's how people who choose not to um, go on diabetes medications are able to maintain good blood sugar control with lifestyle. Uh, but of course, there's side effects for any medication. Uh, the ones in this category are diarrhea, upset stomach, and nausea. I remember one of my clients used to say he had a gremlin living in his, in his intestinal tract. Sometimes it would growl, sometimes it would cause him to have an unexpected trip to the bathroom. It was unpredictable. And if that sounds like you, I would recommend you do one of two things. Well, first, the first thing you do is talk to your doctor about any of those symptoms because um, it may not be the best medication for you. Over 90% of the people tolerate this medication, but if you're in the 10%, then it's just not for you. It's not worth those lifestyle inconveniences to continue on the medication despite the benefits of the medication. The other thing that your doctor may prescribe is to reduce the medication to the point where you tolerated it better. Because this is a medication that we actually titrate. We start slow at 500 milligrams once a day with food, better tolerated with food, generally your supper meal. And then three to five, three to seven days, we add the second tablet at breakfast. When you tolerate that dose, we increase it to um, a thousand at supper, 500 at breakfast, and, and get up to the 2000 milligram level, if possible, that is a therapeutic dose of that medication. Um, but again, it's individualized and you know your PCP is best to tell you what dose is best for you. The other thing I wanna let you know about this one is that it is, um, there is an increased risk for a B12 deficiency with this medication. This is important because after the age of 50, we, we absorb B12 less frequently. We have, we, we've just re absorbed less B12 in our systems. And so um, B12 is essential for your energy levels, your memory, and for nerve health. And so this is a really important factor that if you're on metformin, I do recommend a B12 supplement. It could be part of a, um, a B complex or a multivitamin, but please, um, please be aware that if you're on metformin, it can deplete your B12 um, reserves, and that's important. All right, that was a big one. The next ones aren't going to be as long. Uh, the next category is an SLGT2, or your sodium glucose transport protein inhibitors. Whew. These medications have been available for three to five years. 
but they're very commonly prescribed at this point. You might recognize some of the names Invocana, Farsiga, Jardians as some of the uh, ones. So what do these medications do? They actually increase glucose excretion from your urine, that you spill sugar. You spill sugar into your urine and you pee out sugar. Uh, in general, um, as, the, as the glucose travels through the body, it does go into your kidneys. All of us have this renal or kidney threshold um, where if the kidneys detect the blood sugars are above 180, they'll actually spill the sugar into the urine. We all have that capability. We have the checks and balances in our system to allow us to have, um, you know, it lowers the blood sugars before it enters the rest of the body. That's a wonderful thing. Our bodies have many mechanisms like that for self-preservation. So um, this, this category of medicine lowers that threshold from 180 to 150. So benefits, again, no, no low blood sugars or hypoglycemia. It actually has been shown to um, improve blood pressures because your kidneys regulate your blood pressures also. Uh, it does not promote weight gain. It actually, it's not uncommon to have um, three to five pounds of weight loss taking this medication. And again, it lowers your A1C by a pretty good amount. So all sounds great until you need to consider the side effects. Um, hypotension, that means low blood pressure. It's a risk factor as is dehydration because you're peeing more. If you're just eating willy-nilly and you're just taking the medication and your blood sugars go above 180, you're gonna be running to the bathroom peeing more because your kidneys are gonna be working, working hard to spill sugar. It's not good to continually have your kidneys work that hard. Urinary tract infections is another one as are genital infections because, um, because of the extra sugar, um, yeast tends to live in those areas of our body. And if you have increased yeast, they feed on sugar and you're more apt to have infections. Um, and again, I'd mentioned increased urination. A really, a really uncommon but serious side effect of this one is ketoacidosis, where you're actually um, hospitalized for it. So it's not a medication to take lightly, but it does have some good benefits. And uh, if you are prescribed this medication, please be sure you hydrate. You want to make sure you take lots of fluids regularly. Um, you will be using the bathroom more frequently, but um, reduce, having adequate fluid consumption does reduce your risk of those side effects. All right, the next category of medication is called DPP4 inhibitors. They've been around for close to 15 years. I call them the Paul Revere hormones um, because how they work is like this. When food enters our small intestines, we have hormones that let the pancreas know the blood sugars are coming, about to rise, and to tell the liver not to break down glycogen into sugar. Essentially, these hormones sound the alert. The sugar is coming, the sugar is coming. So, um, it's, it's a good thing. It gets the pancreas ready to do its job. The problem is, is these, um, that people with high blood sugars, these hormones are deactivated very quickly, seconds in some cases. Um, and if, you're, if your blood sugars are chronically high, they're not working. So um, this medication helps them work again. So what did the medications do? Um, as I mentioned, prolongs the action of these gut hormones, those DPP4 um, hormones, um, increases insulin secretion because that's what they're designed to do. It also slows the emptying from the stomach. Um, so instead of food emptying all at once, it gradually slows it down to help your body tolerate and uh, handle the blood sugar rise. And as we've mentioned before, reduces the glucose release from the liver. Sounds great. So why isn't everyone on these medications? Um, benefits, no low blood sugar, doesn't cause weight gain, so far so good. Doesn't reduce the A1C by much. It's 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. Um, side effects, I mean, in all honesty, most medications will have these side effects, uh, headaches and flu-like symptoms. Um, uh, can cause severe debilitating joint pain. I've not seen that, but it is, it is on the label. I guess my issue with this medication category is it doesn't give you the best bang for your buck. 
I really haven't seen great results in persons with high blood sugar. So if you've been on metformin for a while and this is the second medication your doctor is prescribing, I'm not, I'm not sure you're gonna get a lot of benefit from it. I really think that this, benef this medication um, is best earlier in treatment with good lifestyle habits. Um, if, if you've had diabetes for many years um, and you really, you know, you prescribe the medication and you don't see a change in your A1C within three months, I, I would recommend you consider looking at an alternative medicine. On the other hand, uh, if it's early on in your diabetes journey and you don't tolerate metformin, and your doctor says, what about this one? And you see some benefit, you do some good lifestyle ch changes, great. You know, so I, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not for everyone. Um, and those are just my personal comments on it. Okay. Next up is sulfonylureas. Whew. This is the very first category of oral medications. These have been around for many, many years and have had multiple generations, um, which means new upgrades, new upgrades, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Um, glimipiride being the last um, and perhaps the best of the bunch. So common ones are your, your glyburide, your glipizide, your glucotrol, amaral, the glimipiride. Um, so if this category has been on the market the longest, you may be wondering why it's not the first one prescribed. It's because of its side effect. Its biggest downfall is hypoglycemia, low blood sugars. And the reason for that is what it does. It stimulates sustained insulin release. It tells your pancreas, the cells that make the insulin, to produce as much insulin for as long as possible. Well, unfortunately, that puts you at a higher risk for low blood sugars. Uh, I used to work at the nursing home over um, in the county, the county nursing home, and most of the persons with type 2 diabetes there were on this type of, well, actually weren't even on this medication anymore, but they were started on this medication. And when they were put on this medication, they were told, you must eat small frequent meals throughout the day. The reason for that was because you wanted to prevent low blood sugars. You, if you didn't eat enough carbohydrates or you skipped a meal and you took this medication, you were at risk for low blood sugars. So these, these residents were accustomed to having six meals a day, even though they were not um, on this medication anymore. So I had to be creative and sometimes it was, you know, a small, small snack, but for the people that would have benefited from weight loss, we had to switch it to a diet soda and a sugar-free popsicle or diet jello as their snack um, because they didn't want to give up the, the routine of the snack, but we had to work with the newer diabetes medications they were on that didn't promote, um, didn't promote the low blood sugars. Another issue with this category of medicine is that I have found, and this is my own personal perspective, um, that it does prematurely exhaust the cells that produce the insulin. So it sets you up, it sets the user up for the need of injectable insulin down the road. Um, so, you know, why if it so why do we still use this medication at all? Well, it works, it works really well. It reduces your blood sugars. It reduces, reduces your A1C and your blood sugars to a safe range. It's inexpensive. It, um, it can affect your A1C by one to 2%. So that's great. So sometimes we need to focus on the here and now and do what we're able to today to lower the blood sugars in the most practical manner. Um, perhaps short term, it's, a, it's, it's one of the better options for you. Um, just just something to be aware of. Okay, the next three categories of medications are not used frequently, but they do have a role to play. So I'm just gonna go through them quickly. Quickly, maglitinides, they're the Prandex and the Starlix. What they do, they're similar to the sulfonylureas. They do stimulate a rapid burst of insulin. So they're a little bit better than the sulfonylureas where they don't last forever. They have a shorter duration of two to four hours and they lower your A1C by one to two percent. Of course the potential side effect is hypoglycemia. Um, 
The, I believe one of them is now in a generic form. I think the reason why I haven't seen a lot of them prescribed is because they're, they're expensive. Um, but that may not be the case anymore. Again, I have not seen a client on these medications in over three or four years, so I may not be up to date on which ones are generic, what the cost of these ones are, but it is an option if the, if the doctor is suggesting sulfonylureas, then maybe switching to these if the, if the cost is similar would be a better choice. Uh, next category is alpha glucosidate inhibitors. Again, don't see these much. I think I've had one client in four years on these. Precose, precose and Glycet are the, um, are the names. And how they work is they delay digestion and absorption of carbohydrates. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, wait till you see the side effects. Um, the benefit, it reduces your A1C by a half to 1%. So not a lot of bang for your buck, but most of the people on this one, GI intolerance, flatulence, which is gas, can cause low blood sugars. Um, and the other thing is they have to be taken. If you're on this medication, they need to be taken with each meal. So you know, it, it, it increases the risk of not taking the medication on a regular basis. Um, so, and if you do have a low blood sugar, you have to treat it with glucose only, okay? Um, so it does, it, it, it slows the, the treatment of low blood sugars because of, of how it works. And then the last are the TZDs, um, Actos and Avandia, for those that um, may remember those. If you've had diabetes for a while, you may have actually been prescribed them. Very few people are on them right now, but they used to be very popular diabetes medications when I was training to be a diabetes educator about 15 years ago. Now they have very limited use in black box cautions. Black box means severe risk. So what do these medications do? They increase your insulin sensitivity. That would be fabulous to have a medication. So the underlying cause of type two diabetes is insulin resistance, where if insulin's the key that unlocks your cells, when, you eat, when your blood sugars rise, your pancreas secretes insulin, insulin goes around to unlock the cell doors. Well, the cell doors don't open, and that's because of insulin resistance. This changes that. So this is truly the only category of medication that really addresses the underlying cause of type two diabetes. With the roses come the thorns, however, what it does, it does free up fat from the cells in your abdominal area, um, which, is, which will indeed make insulin work better. But the fat's not burned, it's just stored elsewhere. And one of the biggest side effects is edema. Um, the other thing to be aware of, if you're ever prescribed this medication, it takes, it takes about six to eight weeks for it to work. So you know, you're taking it, you're taking it, it's like it's not, you're checking your blood sugar, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. It really does take about six to eight weeks. Um, but realize most users of this medication can expect weight gain despite blood sugar control, better blood sugar control because of um, fluid retention. And it lowers your blood sugar by a half to 1%. I mean, with, with those side effects and limited, limited efficacy, it's, it's not one of the medications that's commonly prescribed. Potential side effects, congestive heart failure, edema, weight gain. Um, if you're on Actos, increased risk for bladder cancer, and both have increased risk for peripheral fractures. So, some people do well on this medication. Most people in, in the United States have been taken off this medication. I, I've had clients say that it was the only time that their blood sugars were really in good control with this medication, but personally, I would be cautious of it. And there are also finally many other combination oral medications. Um, most are combined with metformin. So if you're on metformin and you have another oral medication, Check with your doctor to see if, it's, if there's a combined medication. An example would be Janumet, which is Genuvia and Metformin. Well, uh, it, if, you're, if you're on the, you know, they can, they can give you one pill instead of two pills. You could save in a copay in addition to um, limiting the number of pills you take on a daily basis. So if you've been on oral medications for a while, 
do check with your PCP to see if there's a combination medicine that can that could save you the copay and the number of pills you take. And sorry, before we move on to insulin, I'd like to share one of my favorite options for diabetes medications. It's injectable, but it offers many benefits. It's called GLP-1, glucon-like peptides. And again, these are those Paul Revere hormones I discussed earlier. But remember, if your blood sugars are high, they get deactivated. Well, this medication is injectable. And because of that, it gets around the deactivation in the, in the GI tract because it goes directly into your bloodstream. So common, common names um, that you may, you may see, Bieta, Victoza, Tanzium, Trulicity, and Adlinzic. Oftentimes, it's only a once a week injection. Most of these are once a week. Some of them are once a day. And the Bieta, um, and it used to be, it was the first line of medic, first, first one in this category was twice a day. But most people don't take Bieta twice a day anymore. So once a day or once a week. Um, so what do they do? Again, it increases insulin secretion whenever it detects your blood sugar's high. So let's say it's not only related to meals, it may be that you're sick or you have stress. Um, it helps your pancreas secrete insulin to regulate those hormones. Again, reduces the glucose um, from your liver and delays the emptying of food from your stomach. It also promotes satiety, which means you're not as hungry, which means that most people on this medication also um, not only don't gain weight, they lose weight. Um, so the benefits, it lowers the A1C by a half to 1.6%. I tend to see the higher range, but in some people it is the lower range, which really isn't that, that strong an efficacy. So if you've, you've had limited benefits from it, then this may not be the medication for you. Again, most people, most of the users lose weight and uh, this is a really good one if you are a commercial truck driver because um, it does work and a lot of times, you know, you want to avoid the insulin because there's a lot of um, extra red tape that you have to go through if you're a commercial truck driver on insulin. Um, you have to submit logs to your insurance company and show that you're in good control. So um, this one can this one can do a similar benefit and there is now um, some agencies recommend to start this instead of basal insulin if if your blood sugars are high so side effects nausea headaches diarrhea and increased risk of pancreatitis so don't take those side effects lightly but um, it does do a lot of people really really have good results with this medication so there you have it an overview of the oral diabetes medications or the non-insulin diabetic medications, how they work, as well as the benefits and the risks. Whew. But let's say your blood sugars aren't at goal on the oral medications, or you have type 1 diabetes. Then insulin will be needed. Um, but please realize not all persons with type 2 diabetes will need to be on insulin. If you put on insulin, it's not because you failed. Many years ago, um, you know, it used to be used as a threat. Oh, if you don't do better, you're going to have to go on insulin. I'm going to put you on insulin. But nowadays, the individual with diabetes is in control. They have the choices. So they can choose lifestyle. They can choose medication. Um, and sometimes it's just as we get older, our body produces less insulin. So it's not a failure. Don't, don't, you can't change the past. But if, if insulin is um, a consideration and needed, it's because your body isn't producing enough insulin and you're at greater risk for long-term complications. So it's still a good option to give you an improved quality of life. So let's dive right in. So there are six types of insulin. There's rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting, long acting, ultra long acting, and mixed acting or mixed insulins. Um, if you're a person with type one diabetes, um, most likely you'll be using a rapid acting at meals and a long acting once or twice a day. Or if you run an insulin pump, it only uses rapid acting. Um, persons with type two diabetes may use any of these types 
depending on many factors. That could include your body's insulin production, what your current blood sugar values are, as well as other factors, which include affordability, dexterity, eyesight, um, dexterity. So if you are, some of the insulins come in pens and some of them come in vials with syringes. So if you are unable to put a syringe into a vial of insulin, um, or see to be able to do that, uh, or see the gradual, um, the, the, the amounts on the syringe, you're not, you're not a good candidate for the, the vials in the syringes. So, but realize the others, the pens are a little bit more expensive. So there's a lot of balance that we have to look at. Um, as I said, not all, most but not all insulins are available in pens and vials. Um, the, the vials are less expensive, but they do need syringes, while the pens are easier to dial up your dose, um, and they have a built-in plunger, um, but you still will need pen needles um, that are screwed on to the, to the tips of the pen prior to use. Regardless of which, which type of injectable um, mode you take, always a good idea to have your injection techniques reviewed by your PCP or diabetes educators. You never want to inject into the same area on a regular basis because what happens is um, you'll, you're going to get hard lumps underneath the surface of your skin and you're going to reduce the absorption. There are many, many tips and techniques how long you hold it in injections that it's, it's a good idea so that you would get the maximum benefit from your injections. All right. So let's look at a table that reviews the different types of insulins. As I'd mentioned, you're gonna see the six types listed here. At the top of the table, you'll see onset, peak, and duration. So um, they, they all have different, they all, onset means how quickly they start working. Peak is when, when they maximize, and duration is how long they last in your system. Uh, if you have any issues with kidney problems, um, they actually last a little longer because insulin's cleared through the kidney, so insulin um, is, it tends to stay in your system a little longer, increasing your risk for low blood sugars. Okay, we're gonna first start with rapid acting insulins. Um, Believe it or not, this is usually the second insulin that's introduced in persons with type two diabetes. Um, the long acting or what we call the basal insulins would be the first, we'll get to those in a minute. So rapid acting insulins, sometimes called bolus, are your shoot and eat insulins. They're best taken within 15 minutes of the start of your meals. Most start working within 15 minutes, peak within a half to two hours, and last for two to five hours. So that, that works with how your body digests food. The glucose from your carbohydrates will peak within a half, half hour to an hour and a half, and you know is hopefully um, stored or used for energy within the two to five hours. So that's, that's kind of how that coincides. The list of common acting insulins um, are Aspart, Novolog, Humalog, and Epidra. You're going to see that there's two asparts, the phi as aspart. You try saying that three times real fast. <laughs> Starts working very quickly, actually in two to five minutes, and um, is touted as a before or after meal insulin. So if, you, if your meal is finished in 15 minutes and you take the phi as aspart variety one, um, you can still kind of match your insulin uh, peak to your blood sugar peaks. The other rapid acting ones are generally um, work 15 minutes. They take about 15 minutes to work and are best taken before meals. Um, the Humalog does come in two doses, a standard dose, which is called a U100, and a double concentrated, which is U200. The U200 is used for persons with higher insulin resistance or typically has a lot of abdominal um, fat or for individuals who need higher doses. Um, this would actually lower, lower the, the dose that you um, inject, but give you um, the same amount of insulin because it's twice as concentrated. Uh, regular insulin is an older insulin. 
and has a slower onset and peak, but stays in the bloodstream a little longer than the rapid acting versions. So it's, it doesn't quite match the rise and falls of your blood sugars, but it is, um, it is far less expensive. Um, it's available in two versions, the Humulin R and the Novalin R. Uh, Walmart sells its rely on version over the counter through the pharmacy. Um, regular insulin is also available in a, in a very concentrated option. It's called U500, which means that one unit of that insulin is equal to five units of the um, of the U100. So if you're taking 25 units of insulin before your meal, your doctor may switch you over to this one, which means you'd only be taking five units of the U500 versus 25 of the U100 of the regular. Anyways, available only through prescription. This is a very concentrated insulin and not um, designed for every person with diabetes. Um, it's really for those who are the most insulin resistant. Um, okay, to find out if the the short acting insulins, the short, um, the rapid and short acting insulins work. The best way of knowing if you're taking the right dose is to check your blood sugars after the meals, because um, ideally your blood sugars are within 40 points of your pre-meal blood sugar two hours after your meals, and or or even a little lower if these medications are working if these rapid and short acting insulins are working. All right, so we're gonna look at that chart again of the six types of insulin. And we're gonna go down to the lines three, four, and five. And the next category is gonna be your basal or background insulins. These insulins are the intermediate, long, and ultra long acting categories. As you can see, they have a slower onset peak and duration. They're designed to help control your blood sugars between your meals and while you're sleeping. The intermediate insulin is called NPH. Like regular insulin, it's older, less expensive, and available over the counter at pharmacies. It does have a more defined peak and can cause more low blood sugar reactions when compared to the long and ultra long acting ones. Levomir and Lantus are the common long-acting insulins. Levomir, in my experience, doesn't last the full 24 hours and is commonly prescribed twice a day, usually before breakfast and before supper, while Lantus and Balsaglar generally do last the 24 hours, and they still may be given twice a day if you need a larger dose. Um, it's common if you're, if you're injecting more than 50 units a day to divide that dose um, just to give you the, the most uh, benefit of the action. Tegeo is three times as concentrated as the other long-acting insulins. So again, taking one unit of Tegeo would be the same as taking uh, three units of Levomir and Lantus. Um, costs, of course, have to be considered with all of these. The newer kid on the block is Traceba. This insulin comes in two concentrations, but it does last for up to 42 hours for, for, very, for really more consistent blood sugar control. Um, again, remember these medications are designed to work to control your blood sugars in between the meals and while you're sleeping. And a fasting blood sugar actually is the best reflection of efficacy in these insulin. So, um, if your fasting blood sugar is too high, we would adjust these long-acting insulins. And if it's too low, we would adjust the long-acting insulins. All right, almost done here. Uh, combination insulins, it, there's, um, these are another option for insulins. Uh, it's usually a combination of rapid or short-acting with an intermediate or long-acting insulin. They're usually taken twice a day before breakfast and before supper. Um, I did have a client who um, was prescribed this medication and told to take it twice a day. And he took it before, you know, 12 hours apart. He took it like eight o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the evening. Don't do that. These medications actually have a small amount of the rapid acting and again, um, a larger amount of the long acting. And so, you know, between 25 and 
30% may be the short acting or the quick acting, and then the rest is the long acting. So if they're designed to be taken before your meals, um, before breakfast and supper. And um, if, if you don't do it that way, you really run the risk of the, the blood sugar roller coasters. This poor gentleman had low blood sugars every night before bedtime because he was, he was injecting the insulin at the wrong time of day. So um, best to be taken before breakfast and before supper. Um, it sounds like it may be a good choice for many people because it's two shots instead of potentially four shots a day. Persons with type one diabetes can take this, persons with type two. On the flip side, realize that um, there's some, there's some considerations with this medication. You have to mix it properly. Um, you have to either roll it or, um, well, roll it like that if it's a pen or tip it back and forth if it's a vial. You wanna make sure it's properly mixed before you inject so you get the right dose, the right um, percentages. And you're less flexible with your diet guidelines on this medication really important that you don't skip meals and you're very consistent with your carbohydrates and despite all that you may not get optimal control um, you'll get good control but it may not be the optimal control you want the only real way to get optimal control is with the with the individual insulins um, but again you run the risk of low blood sugars um, too so uh, it gets back to your target blood sugar range and where that range is best for you um, and finally, there's a couple of newer injectable diabetes medications that actually combine those GLP-1s, those Paul Revere hormones, and the basal insulins. Um, they are Siliquia and Zoltrophy. Um, so, and remember before I had mentioned earlier, there is an inhaled insulin option available, uh, not, not for persons with respiratory issues, but um, there is an inhaled insulin. I have yet to see it prescribed, but it is on the market. Okay, well, there you have it. If you're new to diabetes, I hope you have a better understanding of what medication options there are. And if you're currently taking a diabetes medication, then understand what the medication is doing to improve your blood sugar control. And um, also, if you've been having some nagging side effects, is this medication causing it? Um, so it's, it's good information. So thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing uh, you on our next show where we'll have members of the community again and we'll be discussing some potential long-term complications of diabetes and what you need to know to prevent them. Until then, stay in good health. Take care.